Hey everyone, welcome to the KE Report and a company update from District Metals, chatting with Garrett Ainsworth, the president and CEO. We're going to be providing an update on the work that has been recently completed and some that is ongoing at the company's uranium projects in Sweden. Also comment on the share price that continues to perform very well. The share price has pretty much gone vertical since May and continues to move higher District is traded on the TSX Venture Exchange under the symbol DMX, on the OTCQB under the symbol DMXCF, and the NASDAQ First North Exchange DMXSESDB. Garrett, as I mentioned, let's start off with the share price action. Ever since we talked back in May on the back of that financing, the share price has been performing very well. I've had some questions asking, What's driving this share price action? Yes, we've seen a better environment or back to a more positive environment for the broad uranium sector, but the district share price has just done so well. So any insights on what you're hearing from investors and what's driving this strong price action? Hi, Corey. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I guess I get asked the same question too. So I guess one of the questions I get asked are what kind of promotion are you doing? And my answer is we're not doing any real promotion like apart from you know podcast interviews with with yourself so it's really good to see this natural you know share price appreciation with district metals and i think you know from a macro level it really has to do with everything remains very positive on the fundamentals for for nuclear and obviously the fuel so you know everything that's happening all the geopolitical turmoil is all kind of working in favor driving the whole theme ahead, along with, you know, a much larger commodity market that's looking very, very good. And dare I say, you know, even a potential bull market that we're in. And then more kind of focusing down at the district metals level. I mean, we're, we're being very busy, you know, flying airborne surveys on our uranium polymetallic projects. We've put quite a bit of news out about that that we can talk about more, but it's all kind of working together nicely. And then, you know, the latest catalyst that we've got here is it's possible it's not confirmed but it's possible that district metals might be getting added to the global x uranium etf and if that happens then that that will you know basically stir up quite a bit of additional buying or maybe that's happening right now i'm not too sure but my understanding is this this friday we should know you know if that's confirmed or not and then the rebalancing of that etf i think it's ura will occur on July 31st, so not too far off. Okay, thanks for those insights. Just interesting to see the higher volume as well. I didn't realize about the URA rebalancing, so maybe that's a driver too. But look, overall, to your point, it is a bull market for commodities, and uranium has come back into the light. Let's talk about some of the recent news, one being the completion of a mobile MT survey at the Vikan Project and commence mobile MT at Alum Shale Properties in Sweden. This also ties in with a more recent news release from July 22nd of some radiometric and magnetic surveys at three different projects in Sweden. Let's start with that mobile MT survey at Beacon. This really is the flagship project. What do you hope to find out from that? What will come out of that survey? Yeah, so with the mobile MT survey, it's never been done in Sweden before. It's a relatively new passive electromagnetic geophysical system flown by helicopter. You know, we did some forward modeling with our geophysicist, Kyle Patterson, and it showed that it would work. But when we flew it and we actually saw that it worked, it was a very happy moment because it's mapped out the alum shell at the Viken deposit perfectly. It's showing us the depth to the alum shell and the thickness of the alum shell that correlates with historical drilling. And this is really important because now we're, we're going to get a great picture of the whole Beacon property and also our alum shell properties further up to the, to the north northeast that will really help us pick you know, the best spot to, to do an updated preliminary economic assessment. So it's the fact that this has worked and, and no other you know, geophysical survey has been able to do this you know, VLF or, or, you know, SkyTem or VTEM has never been done on it, but those, those would not work because they're, they wouldn't be able to see the thickness, only the, only the depth based on, on the forward modeling. So it's a huge success for exploring alum shells and the, and the fact that we, 
we've been able to crack this is uh, yeah, it's very good. Okay. So on the back of these results, then how quickly do you think you could get on site to do even more work here? And what would the follow-up work look like? Yeah. So it will probably have the final data probably in about three weeks or so. And, and then we'll need some time to do for the vacant property for the mobile MT. And, and then we'll need some time to do interpretation. So hopefully we'll have a news release out on the results of mobile MT on the vacant property out in September. That's what we're aiming for. And then I would think that the results for the alum shell properties, mobile MT will be out hopefully October. And really the next step is, you know, if we pick our target areas and then we drill it, like, because the alum shell is, is pretty flat lying. It's a soft rock. It, it, it's pretty much mostly covered by a thin layer of soil. And uh, the key thing is for us to know what's the shallowest part, what's the thickest part, and that's what we want to drill. And this mobile MT survey will be able to tell us exactly those, those things, which is great. So there's no real field work that we'll do to follow up on the mobile MT other than drilling. And I would think that'll you know, hopefully happen in 2026. You're really starting to go harder at this Vican project. Hey, it probably ties in with that whole uranium moratorium, which we're all waiting to see if it will get lifted in Sweden. But oh, depending on what happens there, it sounds like you're very much going to be ready to go and ready to focus on Vican. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. We're in a yeah very, very good spot. The moratorium, everything looks on track with what the government has previously guided. You know, in June, they... They, they brought the, uh, the bill for judicial review, which is a standard process that you do just to make sure that it all, all is clear as possible. And uh, I, w- I would say the, the guidance, the best guidance to give for when they vote on the bill to lift the uranium moratorium is looking more like October, November, could even be December. But the key thing is that the guidance is still that it'll happen before January 1st, 2026 because that's when the government has stated that they plan to change the legislation to to allow for uranium exploration and mining. So legislation only changes two times a year in Sweden, January 1st and July 1st. So that's very important dates. But I I would say Q4 for the voting of the bill to to lift the moratorium is, is what is best thought of guidance. Now, just remind everybody what that would allow you as district metals to do, because you are flying these surveys, you're doing some surface work, but the lifting of the bill, what does that open up the possibility of you actually doing further on these projects, especially Vican? Yeah, so the lifting of the bill will make changes to the Minerals Act, which will allow us to add uranium as a concession metal or mineral to our mineral licenses. It also changes the, makes changes to the environmental code which allows for mining of, of uranium. And then the, the government's actually planning another, another legislative, le- legislative change in July 1st that effectively will remove what's called a municipal veto. And they plan, and that basically streamlines the process. So the processing of uranium ore into yellow cake, it's not challenged by a municipal veto at, at all. So they, the government's very serious about uranium. They're very serious about critical metals, or cri- critical and important raw materials. So it's, uh, everything is, is trending in the right direction here. Sorry, I was muted there. Garrett, what about some of these other surveys, the radiometric and magnetic surveys that you're doing at these uranium polymetallic projects in Sweden, the three of them? What, what's going on here? Yeah, yeah. So we're, we're flying a drone or UAV a radiometric magnetic survey at Ardnasvada, Sakjarn, and Nineforce. Now, these are not alum shell properties. These are, you know, actually quite a, quite good grades. Some of them have boulders with over one percent uranium. You know, drill holes at Ardnasvada. There's like seven meters or nine nine meters of zero point seven percent. So, sorry, zero point one seven percent. At Ardnasvada. So these are yeah, very good grades of uranium that would be comparable to what you would see maybe in, in the USA within the Colorado Plateau. And so flying this radiometric magnetic survey is going to be key in basically finding radiometric signatures 
that are coming off of or covering, you know, outcropping mineralization. And then from what we know historically, the mineralized zones that exist on all three of these properties have a moderate to high magnetic response. So we're looking for, you know, something that's got a bit of a magnetic kick to it and then also a radiometric or radioactivity specifically associated with uranium. So the, the drone survey radiometrics will actually be able to distinguish between uranium, thorium, and potassium. That's very important because we do not want thorium, we do not want potassium. And we know, you know, the ice, the glaciation direction was from northwest to southeast. So our ideal target is really a basically a radiometric tail or train that's you know, trending towards the south or the southeast, coming off of a moderate mag or high mag anomaly that could be radioactive itself. And then we, we will be following these signatures up on the ground with, with prospecting, mapping, sampling. But again, we probably won't do that until till May, June of 2026. So Garrett, if we take a step back, I received this question a couple of weeks ago that asked, how would the company rank all your uranium assets in Sweden? It seems like Viken, obviously, that's the highest up there because of the huge resource that you have there. But all these other projects, and even Viken in itself, where it sounds like you do want to do some more exploration, some more drilling, how would you go about ranking them and prioritizing them if or when this moratorium is lifted? That's a very tough question because I love all the projects we have in District Metals. Yeah, obviously, Beacon would be the flagship, and I, w- I would actually split them up. So we've got five uranium, you know, uranium polymetallic projects, and and Beacon would be number one, and then below that would be alum shells, and that's an alum shell polymetallic, uranium polymetallic type category. So not to be mixed with Arnazvade, Sokjarn, and Nineforce. Those ones are more intrusive related or intrusive hosted uranium systems. Sveta actually has potential for sandstone hosted and unconformity uranium mineralization. But I would say the most developed out of those three would be Sokjarn. It's got a more modern, it's still historical, but it's a mineral resource estimate that's about you know just over a million pounds at about 700 parts per million U308. And so I'd say that's, that's probably the top one of the bunch. And then Arnas Vade also has a historical mineral resource estimate. That would be number two. And then Nine Force is the earliest stage one. It, it has never seen any drilling, but it's got a really good, you know, boulder field of about 500 meters by 200 meters. It's got some boulders up to 1.4% U308. And the Geological Survey of Sweden, you know, they did an exploration target estimate at Nine Force of I believe thir- about 13 million pounds at about 700 parts per million U308. So that, yeah, I mean, the flying that we're going to do with this drone for radiometric and magnetic is going to be extremely exciting to see what we come up with. It's going to set us up for, for field work and then hopefully, again, for drilling in, in 2026 at those projects. Do you foresee yourself focusing on what could be potentially higher grade areas? Does it more depend on size and scale to build out another large deposit? How would you, again, focus your work depending on the type of target you're looking at? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'd say our valuation is on the Beacon property, on the on the Beacon deposit. So that will be our, our primary focus with, with everything that we do. And then, you know, everything else is just earlier stage. So we'll, you know, we'll move it along, but it'll be secondary to, to the Beacon property for sure. And, you know, we'll also be open to potentially optioning some of, some of our uranium projects. Yeah, because it, I mean, we, we know them extremely well. And I think when that uranium moratorium lifts, it's going to draw even more interest into Sweden and we're positioned really well with our, with our projects, but you know, bandwidth wise, it, it, it sometimes makes it a bit easier to bring in a party, another, another party. Yeah. I was going to ask you about that. If you do foresee bringing in another party to move forward, any of these assets, probably outside of Eakin because that is your flagship, but also because you have a lot of projects and you have built up this portfolio in Sweden when really no one was paying attention to that country. 
what else can you share with us in terms of near term catalysts? What can we be as shareholders watching out for news flow wise out of district metals? Yeah, absolutely. So we should have uh, drill assays out from Tom to Bow in, in the coming weeks here. Obviously, we'll, we'll have the mobile MT geophysical results from Vicon out in September. The mobile MT results for alum shales will be out hopefully in October. And then maybe October, November, we'll have the results out from the radiometric magnetic survey as well. Also, you know, September, October, November, we'll probably be getting some information from the Swedish government regarding their progress with lifting, hopefully lifting the uranium moratorium. And then, you know, the plan is once, once it's confirmed that the uranium moratorium, the bill to lift the moratorium has been lifted, you know, the vote, the vote has been approved, then we will commence our work on a preliminary economic assessment. And I should mention, like, when we go to start like a preliminary economic assessment, we're not exactly sure where we're going to do it because the VCAN deposit is so huge and we're only going to do it on a small portion of the VCAN deposit. I'm, I mean, like like maybe 3% of, of the VCAN deposit will be used for a PEA. And so that's one reason why we're flying the mobile MT survey now to make sure that we're in the absolute best spot where we're going to do a PEA, the shallowest spot, the thickest spot, and also the spot that's best for social license as well. So that might exist within the current mineral resource estimate, but it actually could be if it's outside the mineral resource estimate, then we'll have to you know, drill off a, a resource, which won't take long because to get an inferred mineral resource estimate, the drill spacing is 300 meters. So we could probably drill 12 holes, maybe less, maybe nine, and, and probably get to about you know, given given a thickness of over 50 meters of a loam shale o- over an area of 700 meters by 700 meters kind of thing, we could probably get to an inferred resource, yeah, with 9 to 12 holes It's uh, with that kind of spacing. It's pretty incredible that you can do that, but the continuity within the loam shales is so good that, and then we'd be guided by the mobile MT survey. So, it, it, yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun, you know, when this, Hopefully, when this moratorium lifts, we will be going full steam ahead. So, would you not do economics or any certain study on the whole resource simply because it's just too large, or why wouldn't you do it on the whole resource as well? Exactly, it's huge. the The Vikan deposit covers an area of like four kilometers by six kilometers, so we would never do an open pit over the whole area. It would be that would be that would be terrible. It, you're like for one thing, your capex would be so huge, it it wouldn't make sense. And uh, yeah, social license would not would not be very good doing that kind of an area. Our next door neighbors did a scoping study covering a very small area of of their alum shale deposit called Hagorn, and uh, yeah, the results were were quite good. So we've got a good roadmap on how to do this the best way. All right, Garrett, thank you very much for this update. Uh, Again, please, everyone, keep sending me your questions. I'll keep following up with Garrett, especially on the back of more news and any news on that uranium moratorium in Sweden. I'll also post a link to the company's website in the show notes. Garrett, thank you very much for this update. Hope you have a great rest of your week. Excellent. Thanks, Corey. Talk to you soon.